Hello and welcome to A Healthy State, a series where I talk to doctors and other health professionals about important health topics. I'm Dr Nellie Simmons and thank you for joining me. Today's episode is about refugee health. Worldwide, every year, millions of people are forced to flee their homes to find safety. Every year, many refugees and asylum seekers come to Australia, mostly from Iraq, Afghanistan and Syria. This is a constantly evolving political topic and while circumstances may not be ideal, as health professionals, our aim is to work towards equitable healthcare towards all those in our country. Many of our viewers may be of refugee status, and I hope that some of the information in this episode is helpful for you. Coming up, we will delve into some of the barriers for accessing healthcare as a refugee, why it is so important to see a health professional regularly, and what conditions you should be aware of. We will speak about what supports are out there for refugee families and talk about health in refugee children. I'm very excited to have General Practitioner and Senior Lecturer Dr Tian Mahei in the studio today. Dr Tia sees a lot of refugees and immigrant families in her work and is passionate about raising awareness about how we can support them. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks Nalu, nice to be here. Now I've dealt a bit with refugee families in my work in paediatrics and I don't think I really appreciated how much complexity and trauma is there in their backgrounds. Can you speak to our viewers about what some of the barriers are in refugee health and accessing healthcare? Oh, there's a, there's a whole lot of barriers to accessing healthcare. I think we first have to acknowledge that refugees are people who come with a story. So there's a, a story often of trauma, often of displacement. And then you land in a new place you need to find a GP to have a relationship with. Hopefully a GP that speaks your language or one that has access to translate, translation services. And then you have to make time and learn the system about how you access healthcare, how you, you know, get on a Medicare card. It's important that you have a relationship with the GP, but there are a whole lot of barriers to overcome to get there. Yeah, I, I can acknowledge that and in, in my work I definitely saw that. Is it saying that is, it's still important for these families to have a GP? It is critical for people of refugee background to have a GP. When you arrive in a new country and there are different um, needs, accessing Medicare, um, teeing up your vaccinations for kids to start school, needing someone to advocate for you to get Centrelink, networking with the community, the GP is the hub and understands all those networks and therefore it's, it's critical. This is before we even talk about the health, the making sure that screening tests are done, making sure that all the, the blood tests and x-rays and whatever else that we probably would need is, is uh, up to date. So it's important that you have a GP. So speaking about the, the medical side of things, mm -hmm. can you just run us through what, as a GP, what some of the things you look for are in this population and why it's important? So the things that you'd look for in a patient who's of a refugee background vary based on where they're from. As I say, they all have stories. So sometimes people have been displaced, they've ended up in a refugee camp that might have had some health provisions um, provided. So you're catching them up on vaccines if that's required. You might be doing some screening tests, um, screening tests to manage the, um, you know, checking for TB, the vitamin D, um, other health conditions because have, being of a refugee background doesn't mean you don't get diabetes or heart disease and all the other stuff that we have to look for um, and manage. After that though, there's overlying mental health that needs to be managed because a lot of this is traumatic displacement and loss of network and family. So it's important that we deal with all the, those issues and therefore usually the consultations need to be a lot longer than a 15 minute appointment. Um, and so it's all about juggling. A great re relationship with a GP means that your GP is on top of all the, the issues that need to be managed. So we spoke about the, the medical side of refugee health, you know, screening tests and sort of the diseases that we're looking for. But you touched on before about the mental health and the other social connection that's crucial for these families. Can you go into that a bit more for us? Well, I guess when we're talking about health in general, we talk about illness prevention and making sure people don't have certain diseases. But there's a lot that goes into just 
mental well-being and health in that context. Um, so it's important to acknowledge that, you know, your community, um, whether it's a community barbecue or um, networks and music events and all those things tap into what, pe what gives people joy. And when people have joy, in, you know, in themselves, they feel like we're, we are at least postponing or delaying or putting aside the trauma that they might have encountered to land in Australia. And, you know, it becomes a networking event as well to see other people, whether it's people of colour like them or people who share the same culture or people who have an, an, an interest in that culture, which then um, invariably gives them a sense of purpose because you're in a state where you're sharing your culture, sharing yourself, sharing your food, um, your music and all that sort of stuff. So it's important that we, we don't just look at um, health in the medical sense, but in the other social sense. And, and that allows the person to be looked at holistically as well. Yeah. Oh, I love that. And I think we're really lucky here in that we are increasingly a more multicultural nation and we're more accepting of different cultures. So I think that's, that's a really nice thing for us all to think about. We've touched on a few times about the mental health and trauma background in these families. Are there specific services available for refugee families with this sort of background? Yeah, so your GP is the cornerstone of how you access and you tap into health services in Australia. And it's important that you have a GP that's trauma-informed. They can then link you ideally to psychologists that have, uh, have trauma back background or they are trauma-informed as well, who can help you address the issues that might be, you know, that might be part of your story. As I said before, everyone starts with a story it's, and it's important that the healthcare providers, whether it's just your psychologist or psychiatrist and your GP, can all um, address uh, the trauma that you might have. So, yes, you have the, your Beyond Blue and all these other services, um, the Black Dog Institute, they are for the general population. But your GP, given your language and your, your ability to read and access all those services, will be able to tee up and link up services that are specific for you. And I assume language is a pretty big barrier to accessing healthcare. Are a lot of these services offering their services in different languages? Or? Yeah, so the, so you, you would have, um, there is a group of psychologists that can specialise in certain languages. So when you are a GP, let's say if I'm a GP and specialise in, in um, or, or live in and work within a Vietnamese community, I will typically develop a network of psychologists that work with me that are fluent in that language as well. So um, your GP, as I said, is still the primary person that you use to access these resources, yeah. So it sounds like a GP is a really crucial key to, to these families of refugee background. Can you give any advice for our viewers on how they can go about trying to find a GP or what their first step should be? The first step is a network. Usually when refugees arrive in Australia, there is a network, whether it's a network of people from the same community they usually share nuggets of, oh, Dr. Nelu is a great pediatrician and she manages this, or this is a great uh, GP and she, you know, she's well versed in the language. Some GPs speak um, languages that are transferable. So it's important to tap into the network um, and then finding out who the local GP is. But, you know, at your child's school, childcare or whatever else, they usually have um, ideas as to who the local GPs are. Refugee centres also uh, provide social um, information about who, who is there, libraries and, you know, conversation cafes. There's a whole lot of networks that are available that people can tap into and ask, mm, who do you see as a GP? Are they really good? Um, would they be happy for us to, to present as a family? Um, yeah, so it's important to do it that way. OK, so I guess it's about finding your people, finding your community within a new place. Yes which I can understand can be very daunting, but I hopefully this has given some people a, a bit of a first step. Yeah. Do you have any other useful resources or recommendations for families who may be struggling to make that first step? Um, yeah, so Better Health Channel is a great Victorian health website. Um, there are refugee-specific tabs that are there uh, that, can, that people can link into. But a lot of how you, people land in a service, like, you know, we have one of the services where I work or near where I work is called Utopia, which is a refugee-centric clinic. The community health centres usually have GPs that are well-versed in refugee health. Um, so it's about uh, finding out what's in the community as well. Yeah. 
So it sounds like Better Health Channel and local community services are probably the way to go. And definitely from what you've said, GP, like you said, is the, the cornerstone of trying to immerse yourself within the community and to try and sort out all of your health needs as well. Yeah. Well, this has been such a valuable discussion. Thank you so much for going through some of this for our refugee viewers. Um, and for those who are not of refugee background but are interested to hear what some of the challenges are that these families face. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nelly. Nice to be here. Joining me now on this crucial topic about health in children of refugee backgrounds is paediatric doctor, Dr. Reza Kanal. Dr. Kanal has had experience in multiple community clinics and has worked as a children's refugee and immigrant health doctor. She enjoys working with families of different backgrounds and feels strongly about diversity and migration enriching Australian culture. Thank you so much for joining me today, Dr. Kanal. Thanks, thanks so much for having me. Very happy to be here to talk on this very important topic. Agree, this is such an important topic. So let's get straight into it. Now, now every year we get many refugees, asylum seekers and immigrants coming across to our shores to Australia. What sort of proportion of this are children? Yes, actually, um, when you look at families and family groups coming you know, through the humanitarian intake, which is through refugee, the refugee pathway or um, through the asylum seeking pathway, um, that they're not in significant numbers and more than 40% of this is actually people under 18 years of age. So a huge paediatric cohort. Um, and you know, we'll be seeing them across our clinic, in hospitals, in the communities. They're very important to be aware and to, to know how to support them best. Wow, more than 40%. That's actually a bigger number than I had expected. Yeah, and when we're looking at actually like the projected intakes are about 13 to 14,000 per year in the next four years. That's what the Australian government has um, promised and we're hoping it'll be bigger numbers than that. So that's conservative estimates. 40% of that is, we're thinking, less than 18 years of age. So big numbers, big groups of kids. Great. And what sort of areas are you seeing these children coming from mostly? So it depends where globally, you know, conflicts are around the world. Um, at the moment, um, huge groups from the um, Middle East, so from Afghanistan, from Iraq, um, and also from, you know, the rest of it. We see a lot large African populations still migrating through as well. But I think since the 2021 um, Taliban um, uplift, um, from Afghanistan, there's been a huge cohort of Afghani kids. Wow, that's a huge proportion of children who come across here from overseas. And they've got what sounds like some very complex backgrounds. How are the health priorities of these children different or similar to children who were raised and brought up in Australia? Yeah, so as you can imagine, depending on what community and what background they've come from and also what country they've come from, sometimes the exposure to like infectious diseases might be different overseas compared to children that are exposed to diseases in Australia. As you can imagine, rates of infect like tuberculosis, um, the rates of tuberculosis, other infections like that are much higher in the Middle East. Um, and also access to nutrition is a big one. So compared to the Australian um, population of kids where there's for the most part access to fresh fruits, vegetable, um, healthy nutrition and good education around this. As you can imagine in certain refugee camps and along the migration pathway, kids might not have access to things like that. So um, you, can, you can imagine when they arrive, their health needs and challenges are gonna be a little bit different. And the other really big one is no child that arrives in Australia, you know, no matter where they come from, often they won't be up to date with the Australian immunisation and vaccine schedule. So that's also another big point of um, healthcare delivery. And then as you can also imagine, there's lots of similarities because kids are kids, no matter where they grow up and where they're from. So, um, you know, the developmental things we look for, other general health screening is still all the same. Um, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention that, you know, in some of some of these children, they come from very complex background and exposed to um, situations of trauma. So actually being very culturally sensitive when focusing on very simple issues is very important too. So lots of differences there to think about from these children who are coming from these backgrounds. If we've got parents of refugee or asylum seeker um, children who are tuning in today, what sort of health priorities do you think they need to really be aware of in their children and, and things that they need to really look into fairly quickly? I think um, that's a really good 
broad question because I think often um, there's lots of competing interests when you first arrive in a new country. Um, you know, basic things like getting housing sorted. And can you imagine going to the, the other side of the world, not, sometimes not speaking a word of English, and so priorities might be a little bit different. But I would really encourage parents to think about health screening as being one of the top priorities. And, you know, kids might seem completely well physically, mentally, but I think getting a doctor, a general practitioner or a refugee health nurse, someone to have a look and check over. So that takes the mental load off the parents to think about, do I need to do the nutritional screening? Do I need to think about vaccines? So I think a general checkup is really important. Um, and there's different professionals that can do that. Um, and then the other thing is sometimes schooling and education becomes slightly less on the list because there's lots of competing interests. But I think education and schooling for kids is so important and that's probably the first step in kids feeling like this is their home. So actually making that a big priority as well. Yeah, fantastic. Gosh, so much to think about. I, I don't think I can even imagine what these parents are going through at the moment. So thank you for highlighting some of that. Do you have any helpful resources or any tips for these families who have come in terms of what they can do to start looking after the health of their children in a whole new country? Um, it's tricky, isn't it? Because it's a new system. Navigating health systems are tricky for even when we live in Australia, but if coming to a completely new environment, it's just so challenging. I think the main thing would be to not, to not be afraid if you don't know what to do to ask. So the Refugee Health Program is, um, is a community nurse-based, largely nursing-based program, which is available through lots of different council regions in um, Australia. And they're a good resource to go to. It, um, and there are also multiple humanitarian settlement organisations, such as AIMS and MyCare, who really support families to find links with healthcare services. Um, general practitioners are just amazing in what they do, the complexity and breadth of what they deal with. And I think linking in with the GP is a really good first step to linking in with health services. Um, the other thing that often gets forgotten is dentition. Linking in with a dental therapist, hygienist is also really important and it can be, you know, there's multiple resources in the community um, catchment areas. Um, so there's a, probably a few resources to start with. And then the other thing to let families know is if they're really getting nowhere and they're really worried, it's okay to go to the emergency department. Um, if there's acute health needs and they're really worried about their child, that's what we're there for. And if, you know, we see children and we can just link them in and send them home, that's great. That's a good use of resources. Oh, fantastic. That's amazing. Thank you so much for outlining some of that. Do you have any final messages for families who might be tuning in who are feeling a bit overwhelmed with, with everything that's going on at the moment and what, what we as a community can do to support them as well? Firstly, a very big welcome if you're new to Australia. We are so lucky to have you in our community and particularly, you know, um, I've met some beautiful kids. They, they are amazing, actually, and the breadth that they bring to our community to enrich um, our lives, the community, and they, I, I really feel like they uplift our community and they bring so much education to other kids. And I think, you know, you're such a valuable resource um, and you're so welcome. So I think I'd really want that to be known to, to the refugee population community. Um, and other than that, you'll find your way, you know, coming from an immigrant background as a teenager who really struggled as well. You just kind of fumble your way through, but you make it work. And community groups are such a good resource as well. You know, you, you can gravitate towards your community or if you don't want that, that's okay too. You'll find your little world and you'll create that. And um, yeah, we're all, you know, all of the services, we're all here to support you through that journey. Thank you so much, Dr. Canal. It's very clear that you are so passionate about what you do and the work you do for these families. And I think everyone watching today really felt that. So thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Nelly. Thank you for having me. Thank you for watching A Healthy State. I hope you found the information in this episode helpful. This episode plus the rest of the series can be streamed on CTV+. I'm Dr Nellie Simmons and I'll see you next time.